In a couple of minutes, John Suchet introduces a roundup of yesterday's news. Technology has now developed a remarkably efficient invention. A home heating system that actually converts less than half price electricity into continuous controllable warmth. This system stores heat with impressive efficiency, releases warmth as you need it throughout the day, gives you a whole tank full of piping hot water. It's a system that in thousands of homes has already proved to be the most economical to run yet can be installed for as little as £569 for a one-bedroom flat. This system isn't central heating, it's total heating. It works only on electricity. Heat electric. Energy for life. everyone has heard. John Harvey. Harvey, darling. John Harvey. Yeah, Harvey. A sherry I can only describe as... Um... Light, smooth, with an exquisite, silky character. Yeah, it's not naff, neither. <sighs> Wonderful cruise, darling. So, where did you learn to drop your H's? <laughs> now, Arrow. John Harvey. <laughs> Fine sherry. Now, if you're a fan of America's Top Ten, next week there's going to be a slight change. Instead of being on Thursdays, it's now going to be on Wednesdays, but at the same time of 2 o'clock. Now, with the time coming up to 5 o'clock, we go over to join ITN for a roundup of yesterday's world news. Gulf crisis, America wants Russia to support an embargo. In Iran, the group opposed to the Ayatollah. The AIDS victims at last go back to school. After the floods, now a monsoon for Bangladesh. Hello, I'm John Suchet in London with the world news from ITN. Once again, the news is dominated by the crisis in the Gulf. 
America has called on the Soviets to back its plan for an arms embargo against Iran. President Reagan has complained that the Soviets are seeking to expand their influence at the expense of peace. But Russia is calling instead on America to support plans for a United Nations peacekeeping force. In the Gulf, it's been reported that a Panamanian survey ship was sunk earlier this week by a mine. Four sailors on board the Marissa One were killed. American eyes in the sky off Bahrain today. Close-up surveillance from a Cobra helicopter gunship bristling with rockets in the danger zone. 300 feet below them, the US helicopter carrier Guadalcanal on station in the sea lanes, leading the hunt for more Iranian mines. The search area was 50 miles from where the Panamanian supply ship Marissa One sank after hitting a mine, a mine that might have been planted by the Iran Aja. The ship hasn't been moved, but the mines have been taken away for examination. US servicemen appearing relaxed on deck. The captured crew will be repatriated, but the US Navy says the ship won't be returned. Helicopters will first pick up the detainees from the command ship La Salle. The 26 Iranians, who've been kept under close guard, will then be taken to Oman and handed over to a neutral organization under Iranian supervision. Meanwhile, the badly damaged British tanker Gentle Breeze has taken on board a five-man team of Royal Naval bomb disposal experts. It's feared there may be unexploded ordnance on the ship, attacked by an Iranian gunboat on Monday, since when there have been no more hit-and-run attacks on shipping. Iran is thought to have started closing down its European arms buying centre in London. On Wednesday, the British government ordered the closure and gave the office's 30 staff two weeks to leave the country. ITN has learned that the American government first asked Britain to close the Iran arms buying centre three years ago. Iranian exiles staged an anti-Khomeini demonstration outside the building which houses the arms procurement centre to celebrate its impending closure. Their protest aimed not only against the Ayatollah, but against Britain for waiting so long before shutting down the operation. One demonstrator was arrested for disorderly behaviour. I want a lawyer! The demonstration received only passing interest from Iranians employed inside the building, many now preparing to leave the country. Meanwhile, ITN has discovered that America first began pressing for the closure of the centre three years ago. Until yesterday, the government were reluctant to act because the security services were monitoring this centre's activities and preferred a situation where they knew what was going on and the identities of those involved. But today, all Iranians entering the building were still denying that the centre had been used as a front for their country's biggest arms-buying operation. Paul Davis, ITN, Central London. In Iran, a dissident group opposed to the Ayatollah Khomeini claims to have killed 40 Iranian revolutionary guards. The group is an offshoot of the Mujahideen Khalq, or People's Warriors, the main Iranian opposition faction. Its guerrilla attacks have drawn large numbers of Iranian troops away from the main battle zones in the war with Iraq. ITN has received a Mujahideen video of one recent raid just inside the Iranian border at Mehran. The Mujahideen army is basically the anti-Khomeini Iranian resistance force based in Iraq with, for obvious reasons, the full blessing of the Iraqi government. In these pictures, taken by the Mujahideen, we're told a unit of their soldiers is preparing a night attack on an Iranian position not far from the Iraqi border. We're told that this was a carefully planned and extensive attack on a well-defended position of regular Iranian troops. The Mujahideen claim they scored an overwhelming victory, killing or wounding over a hundred soldiers. They also say their attack wiped out all the fortifications and weapon emplacements, plus fuel and ammunition dumps. The devastation afterwards is extensive, although in the darkness that covered both the attack and the subsequent hasty withdrawal, there is no sign of exactly how widespread the damage was. We're shown prisoners and weapons of the type used by the Iranian army, but no casualties. What is beyond question, though, is the Mujahideen is active and well-equipped with modern weaponry. As a resistance movement in exile, they're ideally placed to do exactly what they say they're doing, mounting guerrilla-type hit-and-run operations against an Iranian army already unable to make any progress against regular Iraqi forces. Other stories now in brief. Armed forces in the South African tribal homeland of Transkei are reported to have seized control of the territory. 
Eight government ministers are said to have been placed under house arrest and the Prime Minister has fled. But the South African government says it has no knowledge of a coup attempt. The new Filipino cabinet met in Manila for the first time. President Cory Aquino formed the cabinet after the failed coup attempt of last month. The first meeting of the cabinet concentrated on the country's economic problems. Gunmen shot dead a French Jesuit priest in the southern Lebanese city of Sidon. It's the first murder of a French national in Lebanon for a year. Seven French citizens are among 27 foreigners missing, believed to have been kidnapped there. The British government is to make a final appeal to the High Court of Australia to try to ban the book written by a former British spy. It's just lost its case in a ruling in the Lower Australian Appeal Court. Despite the British government's attempts to ban the book's spy catcher by Peter Wright, hundreds of thousands of copies have already been sold. ITN's Michael Crick reports on who's reading the book and where. Since July, more than 600,000 copies of Spycatcher have been distributed in the United States, where it's been top of the New York Times bestseller list for six weeks. The tenth printing is already scheduled. Another 88,000 copies have been sold in Canada. From North America, tens of thousands of copies, perhaps hundreds of thousands, nobody really knows, have been flown abroad, most of them to Britain. Here, they've been sold on the black market, and even in some bookshops. This shop in Edinburgh gives it away free as part of a special offer. Copies have been sold in the street in Hong Kong and, despite the legal proceedings, Australian bookshops have sold it too. Along with the US, Canada, Britain, Hong Kong and Australia, the book's also been on sale in the Middle East. Holland has taken 30,000 copies and plans a Dutch edition. Extracts have appeared in newspapers around the globe. Here, the Independent printed, without permission, parts of Spycatcher as long ago as last April. The Sunday Times, having paid £100,000, ran one lot of extracts in July before the government stopped them printing any more. Abroad, papers have published selections in Australia, Hong Kong, before the government stepped in, Dubai, Kenya, Ireland, Poland and in the Soviet Union. Because of the legal action, Peter Wright hasn't received a penny in royalties so far, but author's royalties from American sales must already amount to about three quarters of a million pounds but he can expect much more than that. Three American boys who contracted the AIDS virus through treatment for haemophilia have gone back to school for the third time. Two previous attempts to go to other schools failed because of widespread hostility and fear from members of their own community. Robert, Randy and Richard Ray were escorted into school in Saratosa, Florida by a police officer. There have been threats against the boys' lives. Last month, the boys' home burned down in suspicious circumstances. They're now getting a mixed reception from parents at their new school. I think a lot of people felt sorry for them, so when they came here, they felt for them. No one should ever have to go through what they've gone through. So what happens if that kid gets sick on the bus and throws up on my child? Now the boys say they want to get on with their lessons away from prejudice and publicity. A freak monsoon has devastated a large area of Bangladesh only weeks after the same area suffered the worst floods for 40 years. The latest rains have left nearly 300,000 people homeless and are threatening relief operations. A United Nations report says there's an urgent need for more money and medical supplies to stop people dying from disease. The United Nations report says that while there's plenty of food aid to Bangladesh, what the country really needs is medical aid. In many parts of the country, the floods are receding, but that leaves contaminated water supplies which breed disease. The biggest problem is diarrhoea. The UN reports over 5,500 cases, while independent sources say far more people are suffering and dying. Children are especially vulnerable to the problems of dehydration. There's more rain forecast in the next few days for the worst hit area around the Ganges. The vain attempts to replant crops and rebuild houses after the last flood will be washed away again, leaving more people homeless and desolate. President Ershad, who visited the region a few weeks ago, says he has the situation under control, but the UN say that if anything, disease is posing the biggest problem since the floods first hit Bangladesh three months ago and that many more people will certainly die if they don't get help soon. 
business news now. Britain's trade deficit has jumped to a record two and a half billion dollars. That figure shocked the London Stock Exchange, wiping ten billion pounds off the value of shares. Here's Glenn O'Glaser. The size of Britain's visible trade deficit for August, three times as high as in July, has shocked financial analysts. Imports have been rising in recent months. Exports are down. In London, the Financial Times 100 index took a big fall, down nearly 40 points. Experts in London's financial centre believe the August figure is untypical and expect an improvement in the trade deficit next month. The European Community has expanded its industrial technology research program to help European companies fight Japanese and American competition. The EC is to fund 112 new projects, ranging from computer-aided design for shipbuilding to a new kind of photographic film which doesn't need chemical processing. Some other business stories in brief. The first insurance group to be privatised by the French government will be sold by the end of the year. Finance Minister Edouard Balladur also plans to sell off a large deposit bank early next year. American oil company Amoco has found a new gas field in the North Sea, which it says could be one of the best finds in years. And Kenya's president, Daniel Arab Moy, has announced the arrest of several Asian businessmen in Kenya for withholding foreign currency earned in the coffee trade. Fast food retailer Kentucky Fried Chicken is to open a restaurant seating 500 customers in the Chinese capital Peking in November. Kentucky Fried Chicken is owned by PepsiCo, which is also opening two pizza restaurants in the Chinese capital. Later in the program, we'll have a special report from China looking at the problems faced by Western companies trying to open businesses in the People's Republic. Now for Thursday's closing figures. After rising for two days as tension in the Gulf increased, the dollar has again begun moving down. Against the German mark, it fell 0.3 of a pfennig. And against the Japanese yen, the dollar was down 0.35 of a yen. But the pound, reflecting that British trade deficit, fell nearly half a cent against the dollar. Gold